Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Well, 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 good evening. Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Uh, yeah. Good evening. How are you? Did you have a great Labor Day weekend? We did. Today is Tuesday, September 3rd, 2019. 245 days into the new year, just 120 days left. And we are live. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of beautiful downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? I hope you had a great, amazing, safe, fun weekend with family and friends and you got some time off and you had an opportunity to eat too much and drink too much we did all of that and uh we did a replay last night spent time uh with uh family and friends so there you go but uh kicking off this week here on fade to black tonight author and researcher greg bishop is here Joining the show for the first time, I've wanted Greg on the show for many, many years. We finally got it lined up uh, over the last few weeks, and uh, Greg is here. Uh, He's author and researcher and has done so much in the field of ufology uh, going back a couple of decades. Back in 1991, Greg co-founded a magazine called The Excluded Middle which was a journal of UFOs, conspiracy research, psychedelia, and new science. Greg has published five books, Wake Up Down There, Project Beta, Weird California, a a book about weird California sites and and stories, and uh, It Defies Language, a book about uh, E.T. written language. We're going to talk about that tonight. And A is for Adamski. From 2007 to 2011, Greg blogged for the UFO and paranormal site UFO Mystic. And then in 2017, he contributed an essay entitled The Co-Creation Hypothesis, Human Perception, the Informational Universe, and the Overhaul of UFO Research for the Anthology UFOs, Reframing the Debate. His long-running podcast can be heard at RadioMysterio.com. The links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. He has appeared in the documentaries Fields of Fear about cattle mutilations, Mirage Men, which we have discussed many times on this show, based on his book, Project Beta, and the Travel Channel series Mysteries of the National Parks, and most recently on History Channel's Unidentified. He also served as a consultant for the TNN series The Conspiracy Zone with Kevin Nealon, and for nearly two decades, he has lectured extensively at conferences, conventions, from elementary to college students. I would like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, Greg Bishop. Greg, it's about time, man. Greg? Yeah, can you hear me okay? <laughs> okay, don't scare me, me like that. <laughs> We've been waiting for this conversation for so long, and we start off with feedback. How you doing? 
I'm doing good. It looks like my Wi-Fi like took a dump here for half a second. Let's see if it's coming back. Yes, no. it's coming back. Yeah, Can we're all good. Yeah, we're all good, Greg. We're all good. Uh, okay. Pretty exciting times right now in ufology. We have never uh, uh, before had uh, coverage of UFOs in the mainstream media, uh, both on television and in print. You've been researching this subject for a very long time. It's pretty exciting to see UFOs in the mainstream, isn't it? Yeah, and the well, the main thing that you know, apart from the you know, high profile UFOs thing, uh, there's more scientists, academics, and people like that that are less weirded out or embarrassed or whatever to talk about it. And that to me is is pretty amazing, because that means ufology will have an assist or something like that. Uh, now we have a, yeah. say people in ufology educated, but just to get that boost. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I need you to repeat everything that you just said, Greg. You dropped out. Oh, sorry. Uh, what's exciting to me is that science and academia are, are uh, getting uh, interested, and people that are in those fields are less embarrassed, I guess, to talk about it, examine it, and uh, maybe can push us into different areas that we haven't been able to because of the um, sort of the, uh, what, you might call it? what would you call it the uh <laughs> the uh circular nature of ufo research or at least the civilian side for the last 50 years yeah it, it is definitely a circular nature uh what's exciting for me is when i go outside of ufology and i listen to scientists and physicists openly talk about uh et contact and what that would be like in the search for uh, uh, an ET presence, uh, not only outside of our solar system in the Milky Way, but throughout the universe. And that, yeah. that, that includes exoplanets and this constant search now for uh, uh, an intelligent civilization out there. When I hear that spoken about uh, with mainstream scientists and physicists, that to me is the most exciting thing because uh, for them, it was about as taboo as it gets. But it seems like it has finally arrived, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's um, the fact that let, I'll tell you something. I was uh, about to present a paper, a paper, whatever, a, a talk uh, called It Exists. What do we do about it? Which means, you know, the, the, this, this weird stuff, a lot of it is real. So what do we do about it? And right before I was going to give the talk, a friend of mine, um, I was sitting in her office and she said, hey, did you see the newest uh, National Geographic. And from, I think it was April of this year, it's, there was a radio telescope and the big headline on the front cover of National Geographic are, is, we are not alone. So I wondered, huh, I wonder if they ever had a cover that said, are we alone? And damned if they didn't. 10 years ago in 2009, another cover with a star field on it, it said, are we alone? So 10 years apart, are we alone? We are not alone. And what they're talking about is what you just said, exoplanets, which is what reminded me. And there's just so many of them that the, the idea now, of course, is, well, God, if there's that many of them, there's got to be life on some of them. I mean, it's common. Com planet, exoplanets are common. They're not rare, as people used to think. So that's kind of exciting. Now, as to whether they came, they've come here or not, I'm still not sure, but, you know, some, something may walk into my bedroom tonight and change my mind. <laughs> yeah, and Greg, what, what got you started in, in ufology and research? Was it your parents? Were they crazy? Did you have a sighting uh, when you were young? Uh, what got you here? I really don't know. For some reason, um, I used to go to the library every week. I mean, my dad took us. And he said, get three books. As many as you want, I guess, at least three, read them and we'll bring them back next week. For some reason, all I read, or at least 90% of what I read, were UFO, paranormal, ghost, Bigfoot, cryptozoological books, Loch Ness Monster. I read all those when I was a little kid, and I read them until we went to another library, and I finished off all those books, too. So for some reason, I was voraciously interested in the subject. Now, I don't know if that was because of some weird experience or something like that. I don't remember any. I have had a couple of weird sightings of things since then. But when I was a kid, no, it just the interest came out of nowhere. So I don't know. Maybe it was a previous life I was affected or I came from another planet. I don't know. But it's it seemed to just come out of nowhere. And that's all I was interested in when I was a kid. Well, I always enjoy asking. And I didn't do the first time guest disclaimer uh, in my excitement of getting you on the show. I might as well get this out of the way. I'm 
almost tired of seeing it pop up in Twitter. Yes, I did forget, <laughs> which is, uh, Greg, this is uh, just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends and where that conversation starts, it starts, where it ends, it ends, but we're going to end as friends. There, I got it out of the way. The disclaimer is now there. We can move on. Um, That's fine. That's uh, how I run my show, Jimmy. Uh, it's just we're just sitting in a room having a talk. Well, see, I, I always enjoy asking somebody for the first time uh, what they have seen because the the first time you see something that you can't explain in the sky – it is truly an epiphany. It's a life-changing moment. Um, and you've been doing this research for a very long time. Uh, what was the first sighting uh, that you remember? Jeez, I've only seen maybe three things I couldn't explain. The first one I remember, strangely enough, was at Burning Man. And no, I wasn't high. I wasn't drunk. I wasn't on anything, which is kind of weird being at Burning Man. But I wasn't. Anyway, all I saw were these lights they could have been 100 miles away, little faint lights moving in at right angles like they were attached to an Etch-A-Sketch. I watched that for about 10 minutes and nothing changed, so I stopped watching and then they went away later. The second one was an extremely bright light, like brighter than a star, that didn't move. Um, it didn't move with the stars. It didn't move at all. Uh, it was over Death Valley at 2 in the morning when I drove into Death Valley one time at 2 in the morning. And I think it was over the Mercury test site, which is you know in Nevada where they used to test nuclear weapons right? Um, or Area 51, somewhere in there, but it was far enough away to the east of Death Valley. And it was really, really bright. I mean, it wasn't a star. If it was an airplane, it didn't move. And the third one was the most dramatic. That was probably about hmm, maybe nine or 10 years ago. I was flying in an uh, airplane uh, with a friend of mine, you know, like a Cessna. Um, it got very, very... Uh, turbulent. We went weightless in our seats a few times, and we thought, eh, maybe we better go land. So we did, and as I was leaving the airport, this was in Santa Barbara, getting on the freeway, I looked up, and over the end of one of the runways, or at least what I thought was the end of one of the runways, about a half a mile away, maybe less, maybe a quarter mile, not too far, was this black thing that looked like um, a six-pointed I don't know what it would look like. I mean, it looked like a, a wheel without spoke, I mean, with, without a rim. But they were a thick, black, hexagonal, shiny thing with a little with rectangles coming out of the side of it. It was totally black, but it was shiny because I could see the sunlight glinting off it from the sunset. It was right at sunset. I, had, I could see the orange light um, reflecting off this black thing. And it did not move. I mean, it was like stock still. And there was a lot of wind. So um, I don't know what that was. And the weird thing is, Jimmy, this happens to people. I said, that's interesting, and I got in my car and left. I could have driven there in five minutes, less than five minutes. Right. So, Do you know how many times I've heard th this type of uh, encounter? And I've done the same thing myself. Um, it's uh, you absorb it for the moment, and then uh, uh, you, you tend to move on. How big was it? I don't know. From that distance, it was probably a probably a between 100 and 200 feet high it was round it was like a it was like a circle with no you know it, it just had these it was an eight pointed you know it had two two crosses at 90 degree angles and the other ones at whatever the other uh, uh crossing those in between like if you cut a pizza into eight pieces um but it was they were made up these made of these black cylinders that were faceted like pencils or 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 a um uh a um a quartz crystal uh, except it was black. It was like glossy black. So I have no idea what that what it, that is. I I called it into the uh, National mm -hmm. UFO Reporting Center. They had no idea what it was. I called the airport the next day and I said, "Did you guys? Because it was hanging right over the runway we left on runway one five at Santa Barbara, Barbara Airport." I said, Did you, "Was there something hanging over the end of one five over the beach like last night, like a balloon or some weird things?" Like, nope, nobody said anything. We didn't see anything. Like. Jeez, it was right there. It was plain as day, but they they claimed that they had seen nothing. And you didn't take out your camera. I had an old flip phone with a camera on it that probably would take a picture of my hand from four feet away, and you couldn't tell what it was. I mean, it was a really bad camera. Right. But I could have taken a picture, and I didn't. That was the other thing, too. So, you know, what is the first thing people say? They say, well, the aliens told you you should go away. I was like, well, that could be. 
But I also think that when you see something that weird that doesn't w- make any sense, your mind just kind of goes, okay, that doesn't go anywhere, so move on. I mean, it's just a, it's a reaction your mind has because there's nowhere to put that thing. And it was far enough away. I mean, if the thing was right, hanging right over me, probably had a totally different reaction. Well, and this is the other – did you absorb it? You know, did you take the moment to just remember it? And when mm-hmm. you think about it today, is it still crystal clear? Yes, totally. I mean, I stood there for probably a good maybe two, three, five minutes and just stared at it saying, what is that? It's not moving. It's not uh, part of the airport. It wasn't. I mean, it was right at the we took off over it, that spot, like half, not half an hour before. Wow. Wow, that's so a, that's a no good idea. setting. Well, you yeah. know, and this is the other thing. Uh, what do you make of uh, when you have a daylight sighting like that, which I always classify as you know, that's a holy grail moment, because at mm. night it, it, it's lights in the sky. You can't see the structure of the craft, not necessarily. Sometimes you can, yeah. but but a daylight sighting is completely different from a nighttime sighting, isn't it? As elementary as as that is to say. There's a profound difference between the two, right? Yeah, I would say so. I've never really heard anybody put it that way, but you're right, because that's why daylight discs are called daylight discs, I guess, to, you know, just not just UFOs. So, yeah, and the other thing is in the daytime, you not only, you know, there's no lights. I didn't see any lights on it. So it wasn't like these lights zipping around, and it didn't move at all. So I didn't get that. But, yeah, it's uh, nighttime. The other thing at nighttime is you can't see anything and your lizard brain is probably a lot more on high alert. Like, uh, is it going to get next to me? Do I have to run? What am I going to do? This is crazy. There's nobody around me or whatever. But in the daytime, it's like, you can see buildings, you can see cars, you can see other stuff. If you're out in the country, you can see trees and things. So you're not, you don't have as much disorientation. So yeah, I would say that there is a marked difference between a daylight and a nighttime sighting just because of, you know, just visual cues. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm going to change gears just a little bit. I'm going to stay on this path, though, uh, which is you've done a lot of research into contactees, uh, abductions, your book on ET languages, which we'll discuss at, in depth later. Of course, it's not on ET language. It's it's one of the chapters, though, but I can talk about it. Yeah, and, uh, of course, Richard Doty and Mirage Men. Um, mm-hmm. And with with this massive amount of... Uh, contactees and abduction experiences and people that recount their own personal uh, uh, information on this, there's something going on in a very, very uh, wide stroke of of the population. It could possibly mm-hmm. be uh, in, into the millions. What yeah. What's your assessment of, of what is going on? I don't have an assessment of what's going on, except that something is happening to people and it's not coming from them. I don't know where it's coming from. If I had an experience, I might suddenly collapse my, you know, my 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 waveform and suddenly decide, yes, it's aliens coming from other planets. But I don't like to make that assumption because we don't have enough, you know, objective to me, objective evidence for that. We have objective evidence that something very weird is going on and it's not people being nuts. The other part of that, the reason I do that is because if I make an assumption about what it is, I close off all the avenues to any other idea that it might be. Right. So I like to keep those options open. It doesn't mean I don't believe in aliens or whatever. I think it's, a you know, I, people say I was anti-ETH. I kind of was. I guess I kind of am, sort of. But it's it's not because of, you know, being a skeptic and saying this isn't happening. It's because I don't want to collapse my belief system into one thing. Because the minute you do that in ufology, and you've seen this, I'm sure, over and over, somebody says, it's this. No, it's not. It's this. No, it's not. It's this. And they're all right, and they're all wrong. You know, you can find evidence for just about anything in the, in the UFO field. Um, and and you know, the main ideas about ETH, and there's a few others, too, um, those hold up real well, but not always. And the other thing is, and I have a T-shirt that says that. It says, repeatable, but not on demand. <laughs> because that's what that's what you know that's what science demands is repeatability on on demand and you know UFOs the paranormal ghosts maybe um, cryptozoology crypt, cryptids um, uh, psychic functioning those things are repeatable but you can't do it every single time which is what 
makes it difficult for, you know, a Neil deGrasse Tyson to believe that there's anything there. But like I said, as I said, the title of my talk is, is it exists. What do we do about it? So I'm still on the what do we do about it part. I totally am fine with it exists. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you bring up a great point because when you have physicists and scientists, uh, you can divide them down the middle where you have somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, that is steadfast in his in his belief system where you're not going to bend him. And then you have the other side of the, uh, the scientific community that is fascinated with consciousness and and what elevates an atom or a particle into uh, combining uh, itself into a sentient being. You and I are made from atoms that don't have brains, right? But yet we are able to make decisions and have laughter and dream and have uh, identity, an individual identity. And the the scientific community that is fascinated with that understands that there could be something else going on out there that we don't understand yet. And then you have a guy like Tyson who's like, ah, you know, we just die and turn into cosmic dust. There's nothing to see here. Let's let, let's move on. And I just yeah, find, well, that I could find be it true, fascinating. But it's no fun. And that's exactly <laughs> it. You know, um, I'll bring up uh, the, the uh, a point here, and would love your opinion. When you have somebody who is a, a, a staunch atheist, right, a Dawkins, mm -hmm. right, where there is absolutely nothing beyond death, that everything here is chemical, everything here is math, and that is it. There is nothing. And so you're getting up in age and you're getting close to, you know, uh, the possibility of you departing this planet. And what is it about you at that point? Do you care? You know, you're just like, oh, whatever, my life is over and, and it's going to be done. Or you could be on the other side which is wondering about what is going to happen after you die. What's going to happen to your mind? What's going to happen to your spirit and your being? Is there life after death and you want to go and experience that? Isn't that a happier thought than being on the other side, which is whatever? You know, that, that to me yeah. is just boring, it isn't is. it? And I've talked to a lot of skeptical people. I'm in skeptical groups. I almost quit them a few times just because they piss me off so much sometimes. But the fact is that a, the, a few of the people I talked to really got down to brass tacks with them. Um, a couple of them said, well, you know, I just figure I'm smarter than other people. It's like, that's your whole reason for being skeptical because you want to feel smarter than other people. You know, that I, th that just seems so depressing to me, just like you just said. How, why would you shut down like a, a whole vista of interesting thought, um, a history of interesting thought, a history of spirituality, the idea that science is looking at spirituality now and seeing that maybe it's not inconsistent with some of the newest theories? Why would you throw all that away just to feel smarter than somebody else? Yeah, and there's been a strange turn lately in science uh, over uh, the last six months. And it's this, that the Big Bang may not have happened, right? Which is what Dawkins and Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, all of those atheist physicists uh, and scientists, you know, they, they hinge their careers on the Big Bang, that it was just math, it happened, boom, done. Hmm. That the Big Bang now may not have happened, that maybe time is infinite, that the universe is infinite, and we have now found a star that is 14 and a half billion years old. It's older than our universe, which yeah. is impossible, right? It is utterly about. But if this star, which it appears that it is uh, 14 and a half billion years old, then this Big Bang didn't happen hypothesis is is getting stronger and it flips all of those guys uh over and they have to answer for that and i i am i i welcome it don't you 
No, of course I do. And the thing is that even if it's proven by, you know, over and over and over again, they're going to say, well, the data is wrong or these people, that's only one piece of data and, and they're going to fight it to the death. Um, I'm, I am still reading. I've been reading it for two years because it's one of those books where I have to read every page two times to understand what they're saying. It's called uh, Information and, and the Nature of Reality. There's one chapter in there where they're talking about where physics came from and most of our physics, chemistry, all that stuff. And they say, <laughs> basically, the, that, the, their, the ideas that, that physics, or at least older physics and, and uh, most of the sciences have now, come from basically a top-down, there's-a-boss Christian idea of things. And they can deny it all they want. But they said that's the culture that these ideas came out of. And that's why it's that's why it works for them. Um, and that, you know, as people are finding out and more people are finding out and more people that are into this are finding out and also younger people who are younger scientists are finding out, um, none, of, none of that may necessarily be true. It may be that... Things have exist, always existed, and always will, and we have no, we have no conception of how to, how to, how to, you know, we don't, we can't conceptualize that because we're finite. Our lives are finite, at least our physical lives that that, that they say we die at the end of. So it's, you know, if it, you can't even, you know, it's it's even stranger than they can imagine. And I want to imagine stranger and stranger, whether whether it's right or wrong or not, just to keep the options open, as I said earlier. Well, I I. I would like to think that uh, DNA and life and what has happened to create that is beyond chance, right? Beyond chance. This is not a roll of the dice. It yeah. is. It is beyond chance. And that it seems to me that if life exists here on Earth, then certainly it exists throughout uh, the Milky Way. It exists throughout the universe. And what created it billions of years ago there, quite simply, can uh, you can go beyond and beyond and beyond that backwards in time to the point where another universe that was created, you know, and we're talking about intelligent life uh, that accumulates its wisdom over billions and billions of infinite years to the point where if that is God, if that is what people call God, I don't know. If that is the intelligence of the universe, I don't know. But I think that is much more likely than chance. <laughs> I think that is. Oh, well, I agree oh, wait, with you. I, wait. I always go back to this uh, lecture, an Alan Watts lecture, the, the guy that spoke on Buddhism quite a bit. And he said, basically what he said was, um, where there are, he, he, said, he tells a story. Uh, some aliens come to Earth, you know, four billion years ago, and they say, well, a bunch of rocks, how boring. And they come back, you know, uh, 100 million years ago, and there's things crawling around. And they come in and they go, wow, this is weird. And then they come back around now, and there's like people doing things and going into space and all that. And he says, and they say, well, excuse me, this used to be rocks, and now it's moving around. So... That may, you can call it uh, intelligent design or whatever you want. I think it's an anthropomorphization of this idea. But his idea was that life and intelligence and all that is an inherent quality of matter. And given the right conditions, it just happens. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the way that matter is made. It's made to you know, be anti-entropic, to, to organize itself rather than to just be dumb matter. So... Given enough time, apparently, you know, with, under this idea, rocks turn into people. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. And I have said it many times. I need to take a break here. But it, our universe is a situation where you cannot stop life. Right? It has been stopped many times on planet Earth. Right? Mm -hmm. We've had mass extinction events uh, one after another. Uh, and then a couple of days later, life starts again. You know, you have yep. a forest fire, you burn everything to cinders, and you go out to that field or forest uh, uh, a week later, and things are growing. You can't stop life, and that's yeah. just the way that it is. Let's take our break yeah. right here. Our guest tonight, Greg Bishop. And when we come back after this break, I'm going to talk about our UFO community. I'm going to talk about disinformation agents. 
of course, Mirage Men. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. You can follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Greg's website is Radio Mysterioso. I'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Greg Bishop. Excited about this. Uh, uh, Greg, you need to back me up on this. How many years have we talked about getting you on the show? Not sure. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> Greg, this is live radio. You never say that. Okay. <laughs> I switched headphones. Oh, good, good. How long? Yeah. How many years have we talked about getting you on Fade to Black? Oh, God, three or four or something? Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's been a, I mean, man. All right. Uh, it, it's so good to have, finally have you here. I want to uh, I, I want to talk about Mirage Men, and we'll talk about the okay. production of it and your involvement and how it came about. We'll get to all of that. But uh, last year, uh, Richard Doty uh, called into the show uh, on an open lines night, right? <laughs> Just bam, I yeah. got Richard Doty on the air. And I've never had him on as a guest, uh, but we had about a 45-minute conversation that night on the show. And it was an interesting conversation. But one of the points that he did say was this, and I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, uh, his comments on the show. But he said that uh, there were two speakers a-list speakers on the circuit, on the UFO circuit, that were currently disinfo agents. Right? Now, of course, the alarm bells went off. Who who could he be talking about? I immediately made a, a bunch of phone calls the next day uh, to, <laughs> to, to those who I consider to be at the top, 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 right? And it freaked everybody out. Right. And, you know, and and I know I wasn't one of them, but uh, it it caused people to look at others and, and wonder who was Richard talking about now. And the other side of it is, was Richard even telling us the truth? Right. Yeah. Is he just trying to freak us out? Is he just being his old uh, disinfo agent self? Um, I'm not so sure. But the comment was there. Now, when I say that to you, and this is this is verbatim, this is word for word from uh, Richard Doty's mouth. Um, when when you hear me say that, what goes through your mind considering Richard's background? What goes through my mind when you say that is, uh, I really don't care if he said that because if there is somebody doing that, there is so much junk being thrown in the UFO arena still. That it doesn't really matter who's spreading disinfo. And if they are, it's, you know, it's, I don't know if it's a good for a good reason or a bad, but they're not going to do it just to mess with people. They're going to do it for some reason. I would not know what that reason is. But the thing is, whatever you're interested in, if you let the paranoia of somebody thinking, you know, of thinking somebody is lying to you or spreading disin, and disinformation isn't all lies, it's, you know, a bunch of truth with tiny little lies in it. Um, but if you let yourself be carried away by that thought, then you're kind of lost. I mean, you know, you should be able to, you know, what, and I went through a horrible period of por- paranoia, Jimmy. So this is kind of where this comes from years ago. And it wasn't from Richard Doty, it was from some totally different person and reason. But the thing is, if you let that take over, you, you, you've ba- basically effectively lost your ability to take in any good information, any information really, because you, you're, you're suspicious of everything. And then the and disinformation. You know, and, and it just, it never goes away until you finally make a decision. It's like, you know what? I'm going to, this is the way I did it. It's like, I'm going to stop feeling paranoid because I hate it. Well, then the disinformation has done its job then. Right? Well, if it, <laughs> yeah, if it freaks you out, it's partially done its job. Yes. That's another reason why I say, well, then well, who cares? Just ignore it. Go ahead with your stuff. And if something seems right to you, feels right, and doesn't make you feel like you want to go you know, jump out a window or whatever, unless you like that, if you like feeling scared, then more power to you. But 
um, if you can keep that kind of paranoia at bay, then you know it, it, things open up quite a bit. Do you know do you know who um, Paul Krasner was? Yes. Yeah, I talked to him once a um, long time ago. Uh, we 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 were friends for a while, and then we kind of drifted apart. And he's a total hero of mine. He was one of the yippies. He was one of the Chicago Seven. He was one of the people that you know. <laughs> um, Try to raise the Pentagon, levitate the Pentagon, and put up a pig for president, and all kinds of great. That's stuff. right. That's right. Um, but what he, one of the things he told me was, I told him about my paranoia, and he said, "Well, I'll tell you what happened to me." Because he did a, he was obsessed with the Kennedy assassination for a while, which has driven a lot of people quite paranoid. And he said, at one point, I was in Golden Gate Park, and I had just bought a big bag of pot. Like it cost him a lot of money because I guess this was in the seventies or late sixties or something. And he said, I saw a policeman on the other side of the park in Golden Gate Park, like a police car, just driving by. And I freaked out, even though he couldn't see the bag, it was in my pocket. I freaked out, ran over and hid it in a tree and ran away because I thought I was going to be arrested and somebody was following me. I went back. He said an hour later, it was gone. Somebody took it. He said, at that point, I realized my paranoia had taken over so much that I was doing really stupid things. And I said, well, what made you stop? And he said, well, what made you stop? I said, I got tired of it. And he said, it gets old, doesn't it? And that's basically my idea about being scared when somebody says something like that. I'll take it under advisement, but I'm not going to let it rule my like, is this person telling the truth? Is this person? Is this person? I kind of don't care. If they got a piece of information that I think is important and useful to me and answers some of my questions, I'm going to take it in. If it's disinformation, I'll find out eventually. And if I don't, well, so what? You know, <laughs> now that's a, that's a really good point. And uh, I went through a phase about, uh, and I want your opinion on this. This is about five years ago, uh, and this happened over about a three or four month period, where I was in conversations with different uh, people of you know stature of the UFO community, mm -hmm. and every every one of them was warning me about somebody else. Right. And yeah. you got to be careful. This person is probably CIA. And, and I know this is a fact, so you just need to be careful. And then uh, a week later, I would have that person that this person has warned me about warn me about somebody else. Right. And it got to the point where it all went full circle, right? <laughs> where I went yeah. through like 20 or 30 people of one after another warning me about this next person till it, it came back. I was like the game telephone, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, everything just started to overlap. And the, the paranoia and the positioning of different people inside of the UFO community uh, was alarming to me. That I thought that, uh, from my experience of the UFO community, was that everybody got along and everybody listened to everybody else and they were after the same goals. Oh, no, no, no. And it's it's not that kind of party, is it? No, no. I mean, it's just everybody in every group has factions and people fighting each other and distrust and all that. The fact that the UFO community is unregulated and not peer-reviewed or whatever you want to call it, that just makes it even worse. So it's not like the UFO community is a, is a I don't think it's a, um, an aberration. That's just the way people act. And if there's no check on it, like somebody, you know, a bunch of people saying, wait a second, this, you know, according to our standards, this is, uh, this is not how you act or this is BS or whatever. We don't have that. So it can go in any direction and get as crazy as it wants, and it does which actually makes it, makes it fun and interesting, but also makes it toxic and rude and irritating at times, too. Do, so, do you, you know, think – To me, that's a fun ride. It's a more fun ride than sitting still in a, in a quiet car, you know? Do you think, uh, do you think that we have uh, a Doty-type infiltration in ufology? And I'm talking about a direct – you know, from the Air Force, from the Navy, from the CIA – uh, you know, that are that are in the background, attending conferences, taking notes and 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 having the job of a doty today. Probably. And then I hasten to add, but so what? I mean, you don't really need that anymore. You can just look on the Internet 20, 30 years ago. You had to go do those things. Now all you have to do is look at people's emails and look at their Facebook or whatever. 
So probably, but the thing is, I think what they're mostly interested in is not keeping the, you know, keeping the secret from the public. They're more interested in who's talking about something that might be relevant, one, to the national defense, like, you know, secrets, and two, maybe something useful, like TTSA says they're doing. You know, maybe, maybe there's something actionable out of this. Maybe we can figure out, maybe somebody in the civilian UFO community has figured out something about the UFOs that can be useful to national defense or or private companies or whatever, which is a whole nother kettle of, you know, fish. But um, I think that's the reason they'd be listening, not to not to make people crazy or to make UFO, UFO research look bad or anything like that. Um, UFO research does that fine on its own. Um, so it, it's like I said, if it is, well, then so what? It does. I don't think it really affects what people think about or what they, how they talk about things or whatever. I don't, I don't, I really don't think that happens. It's fractured and factional enough as it is. And it need, does, doesn't need to be somebody in there saying, you know, it, it, directing people anywhere. Um, and I don't think that, you know, and that's the other thing about, you're going to get me on a rant, but about the disclosure movement, I've said this a few other places, but to me, the disclosure movement is like asking the parent that always lies to you to suddenly tell you the absolute truth, but you're only going to accept it if it's, if it's what you already know anyway. That, I would say that that is pretty accurate. Yeah, I and, would say that that's pretty know, accurate. So, yeah, it's, it's, you, can't, you, you can't answer your own question with your own question. It just doesn't work that way. I think it's far, whatever the government knows is far more complicated than what we think. And it's probably not even what we think it is. They might be just as confused as us, but have, you know, various factions have better information, may want to know what to do about it, may have artifacts they don't know what to do with yet. I, I do not know. But I don't think they're a whole hell of a lot further ahead than us on what it is. They may be further in about, about on a, uh, further on than we are about what th- what can be done about it. Well, we'll, we'll get uh, we'll get uh, deeper into that in in just a minute. Uh, back to Doty, uh, uh-huh. when uh, I think most uh, people that uh, watch Mirage Men, uh, their takeaway from that is that Doty wasn't apologetic. And and Doty didn't feel bad about his situation with Paul Benowitz. And I think that uh, for most, uh, where I think he was trying to, I think the way that people look at it was he was trying to uh, show his side of it and that it was just okay. He was just a guy taking orders, right? He was just a, a guy in the Air Force and didn't show any any sympathy or empathy. Uh, uh, to to Benowitz or any negative effects that he may have had on people, and that's the takeaway of Mirage Men. Uh, I think that's a general assessment. Uh, when you hear that, uh, what goes through your mind? Well, the first thing that goes through my mind is he was with me when I talked to him about it. When I was doing interviews for the book, he was actually quite contrite. He said, look, I considered Paul a friend, and I kind of felt bad about what was being done to him, what I was doing to him, and I really don't think I'd do it again. And I feel bad about it, and I wish that hadn't happened the way it happened. Now, I don't think he's, I think he had more control over the situation than he might let on. But to my mind, he seemed like, you know, at least he presented to me as somebody that felt bad about what he did. I don't know if he did or not, but he tried to make that impression with me. Now, as far as Mirage Men is concerned, um, you know, documentaries are show you a side of things that the filmmaker want to show you. I don't know if Richard Doty actually apologized or said anything like that, and they just cut it out or didn't use it because they think it was, didn't think it was important, or they wanted to make him look like somebody that didn't wasn't sorry for it. I do not know. I've never asked the director or the producer those questions. Um, but like I said, it, it, I don't know if he was just presenting that face to me um, and he presents another face to other people or what. But as far as I'm concerned, he, he at least tried to feel like he tried to tried to uh, uh, make the impression that he felt bad about that period. So take that for what you will. Well, do you think that he's a professional liar? And yeah, I'm saying I think, that- it, I think that, that was his job. I mean, I think he enjoys doing it. I think he enjoys... Um, uh, like I, I tell people, you know, other people enjoy like, you know, collecting stamps or bottle caps. So Doty enjoys um, messing with people. 
I, I think that's just what he enjoys doing. And I, if he's listening, he's probably you know getting angry with me. But he said he wouldn't talk to me years ago, so it doesn't matter. And I'm kind of sorry for it. I mean, I like talking to him, but um, I, I think he uh, that that was his job, and he's he uh, was or is good at it, or fairly good at it, which is why he enjoyed his work. Do um, you think? Well, by hearing you say that, and I'm almost uncomfortable right now in my anger. But uh, not with what you have said. I'm talking about Doty specifically. Um, do you think that he was misleading you in his apologetic stance about Paul Benowitz? I don't know. You know, I it, it could be that he truly felt um, bad about it when I was talking to him. So we talked a lot. We talked, you know, um, I talked to him a bunch by email and one, in one mammoth four-hour session that he did not let me record. Uh, we just went to a Denny's and sat down and, and talked. Um, but uh, like I said, I, when he was talking to me, I thought, well, at least he kind of feels bad about it. I mean, that, that that's good, I suppose. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it, you know, it doesn't change anything. Um, but I thought, well, at least he said that. So that's fine. Could it so have been? Well, when I, hear... he was talking to me, he seemed sincere to me. Well, that's what I was uh, getting at by hearing you say that. Isn't that the art of the deal for a disinformation agent, for a counterintelligence professional uh, to gain your trust and find your weakness? And maybe he was striking right at it. I suppose. But you know what? So what? I mean, what am I going to do about it? Besides, whether he's sorry or not really makes no difference. The, the, the deal is done. The milk is spilled. Paul Benowitz was affected very badly by it. Um and I hasten to add, and people say this all the time, he was driven crazy by the Air Force. No, he wasn't. He was helped along. He was already well on the way there before the Air Force even got involved. So it's not like they plucked him out of nowhere and started making him paranoid. He was paranoid before he even talked to the Air Force. And I learned this from um, a UFO researcher, uh, Leonard, not Leonard Stringfield, Who's the the re, much older guy that does uh, abduction uh, regressions? Um, oh, I can't remember his name. Something Dan wrong with me. Anyway, uh, he talked to Paul uh, at least a few months, maybe a year before he even called the Air Force. And he said that when he came to the door to talk to him, he came to the – Benowitz came to the door with a rifle and a pistol and said, get in here. The aliens are coming. It's like, What? And this, like I said, I will emphasize this is before he even met Doty, as far as I can tell. And it, it, so, it, see, and this is where, uh, and I know that uh, Richard said something very similar uh, during our conversation. And yeah, it doesn't it, excuse anything. It, it doesn't just gives it, you there, some perspective. That's right. There is no excuse for that. And at at some point, you would think that uh, Doty or somebody else would go. You know what? This guy's unstable. We're taking advantage of somebody that is is you know doesn't have their feet on the ground and that's not cool but instead they looked at it like okay here's a guy that's unstable we can take advantage of this and that's where i think uh, the ethics lines are crossed i don't think they said here's a guy that's unstable we could take advantage of it that it, i don't really think that entered into it what it was was he has figured stuff out he sort of can see what we're doing on the base and he's sort of getting an idea about what's going on. Now, we could tell him to cease and desist and be a good American, which he was. He was in the Coast Guard in World War II. He was, as far as I could tell, fairly patriotic. They actually played on that. Um, but the, but the uh, fact was that he was figuring things out. And they had just put in you know, years, months, whatever, of research and money and everything, effort into creating these uh, you know, radio burst signals and a few other things that he was seeing thinking that it had something to do with aliens and it was it was just their project so instead of telling him to stop they thought well let's figure out how he's doing it one two control who he's talking to about it and three find out who's trying to talk to him to figure out which foreign you know agencies are trying to get through him and through the ufo community to find out national security secrets they figured it was more useful to talk to him and keep him in their confidence than it was to just tell him to cut it out now, after a while, when he started getting more and more unstable, they just, you know, I guess Doty and others just figured, well, look, we're still, it's still useful to do what we're doing, so we'll just let him continue the way he is. And uh, I think they gave him one piece of disinformation through Bill Moore, and Bill told me, um, I told Paul to take it with a grain of salt, 
and not to not to take it too seriously. And he said, well, Benowitz, it was called the Aquarius document. Mm-hmm. And he said he locked it in his, his safe at work and at, at, at uh, Thunder Scientific and never referred to it again, um, which I suppose is something. But the thing is, it affected I'm sure it affected his thinking. You know, just like everything else that was. Well, of course, uh, it know. did. He'd come up with stuff and say, "Well, this is going on," and Doty, whoever would say, "Well, that's very interesting, Paul. Please tell us more." And then they started, according to Gabe Valdez and a couple of the people I talked to at his place, somebody was beaming like pictures of alien-looking things and dinosaurs and all kinds of wacky stuff into his uh, into his uh, house onto onto his uh, listening equipment. On a little CR little cathode ray screen that he had in his in his lab, um, just to just to freak him out. Um, yeah, they were and going just, in and keep, and... actually keep his attention away from the base and more on this weird on this noise that made no difference. Yeah, and going into his house and moving his furniture around. Yeah, uh, and, that's what Doty claimed that they did. Yeah. I don't know. I did not hear that from anybody else that i can remember i think maybe gabe valdez told me that see one thing i people you know they make the mistake saying you know you trusted Doty and bill moore and a few other people and spooks with all this like no i i tried to check as many places i could and if i it was only coming from one source or a couple of sources i couldn't be sure of i would try to say that in the book unless it was inconsequential like who did you know he went to the store that day or something but important stuff like you know he said Benowitz said he had injection marks on his arms that he didn't know where they came from. That's really scary. Doty claimed to know nothing about this. But um, uh, Moore said he saw them. I think Gabe said he saw them. The thing is, if I heard it from UFO researchers and law enforcement like Gabe outside of the UFO, outside of the government, I tend to think that it had some weight, you know, because it wasn't just somebody that had some – that had that had a uh, – uh, a motivation to, to try and, you know, lead me to, to lie to me. Uh, so I tried to treat it that way. If I could get people inside and outside the situation, both telling me the same thing, then I wouldn't really reference it. But if only one or two people told me, I tried to say, you know, allegedly, or this person said, or whatever, to put the story together. Cause you know, the whole story can't be told by one person or even a couple people. I had to talk to, you know, 10, 15, 20 people to, to get to put this story together. In addition to, you know, looking through news clippings and, you know, and, and government documents and all the other things that I, I, I look through to, to put the story together. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll continue this conversation uh, right after this short break. And there's one other part about this because we can talk about Paul Benowitz. Uh, the Bill Moore uh, part of it is something that uh, gets even stinkier. And we'll talk about that. But then, there, you know, dealing with Paul Benowitz is one thing, but but Doty pulled in Linda Moulton Howe and brought her onto Kirkland too as well, and and continued uh, the disinformation. And uh, we'll do all of that when we come back after this short break. Our guest tonight, Greg Bishop. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Our guest tonight, Greg Bishop. Years in the making, we finally got it done. And we're talking about Richard Doty and Mirage Men. And very few uh, people out there, uh, Greg, have interfaced uh, directly with Richard. I know you haven't talked to him in uh, a very long time. But his 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 position in the UFO community and and the damage that was done uh, with Bill Moore, uh, I, I don't think it can really be measured today. And we can always talk about Paul Benowitz, and but there it, it went much further 
uh, than Paul, and it was uh, it was very effective to the point where they even brought in uh, Linda Moulton Howe, brought her onto the base, into an office, and started to show her documents and documents that were fictitious. And, or, you know, maybe some of them were real. That's part of disinformation. But, uh, you know, bringing in a leading researcher like that is a pretty bold move, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, I think that they wanted to figure out, you know, who was talking to whom. So, you know, uh, all in furtherance of a, you know, a, a, a um, intelligence operation, counterintelligence. And there... I've talked to people who have been in uh, Air Force intelligence after Doty, and they said that the, the Doty and other people in the in the who were working on the operation actually, um, th- to their mind, broke a lot of laws about uh, interacting with uh, with uh, American citizens and things you're not supposed to do to or with American citizens, um, and those things were codified before that happened and were strengthened afterwards, partially, I believe, because of what happened at Paul Benowitz. The uh, the atmosphere at that time, uh, Linda doing uh, her her investigative journalism into cattle mutilations and, of course, the UFO subject, and she was right in the middle of uh, – a production with HBO at the time, and things were getting ready to uh, really blow up, and and they knew that. And and Bill Moore uh, doing the things that he was doing. I'm not even so sure now that anything that Bill Moore had revealed, and th- that includes going back to Roswell and uh, the things that Richard Doty said on this program about Roswell, pretty alarming uh, things that they they really looked at Linda as as uh, a tool uh, for this disinformation. And this was going on inside of the UFO community in real time. It was an active program. And to think that things like this couldn't go on, well, they actually did, didn't they? Well, to some extent. But the thing is, that, oh, God, I've been talking about this for so many years. And I don't know how many times I say things and people don't believe me. So I kind of give up. But what happened was uh, Moore was contacted because they thought he could be useful by um, basically reporting on people in the UFO community and what they were talking about. Mainly because, no, mainly only because they wanted to know how it affected national security. Is anybody looking at anything that can give a hint to the Russians or the Chinese or whoever about what we're doing? So what they told Bill Moore was, and it was, uh, if you tell us what people are talking about and who's telling who to, what to whom, as far as you can tell, we will give you documents, uh, documents having to do with the UFO subject. And they gave him tons of them, reams of them. I have some of them. Um, and as far as he could tell, one, a lot of it was disinfo or close to it, and a lot of it was just useless. And he said, I said, so after all this, you know, and I'm still friends with him. So this is why I get kind of like Bill Moore is evil. And he made, you know, he drove Paul Benowitz nuts. Like, no, he had a deal. And it, he said, it's like when you're when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, why, why don't you watch this corner and any, tell us anybody comes by? And then suddenly, you know, like a week later, you're dumping dead bodies. And you're like, I didn't sign up for this. Um, not that he was dumping dead bodies, but he said, look, you know, I had this cut and dried deal. And then suddenly I was doing other things um, such as uh, watching Paul Benowitz and making, you know, seeing what he was doing and seeing who he was talking to and talking to him himself. Um, So he was complicit in it, but I'm not exactly sure if he knew exactly what was going on. He did see Paul getting worse and worse and worse. And as far as, you know, and Bill's my friend, I've known him for, I've known him since 1987 and he's never lied to me yet that I can tell. Um, but what he said was, uh, I warned Paul over and over to top, stop taking this stuff so seriously. Back off of it. It's affecting your health. It's affecting your business. It's affecting your family. Just slow down. You see, he could see it happening. He knew, where, you know, he, he knew it was being encouraged, but he couldn't tell Paul that. 
but he, what he could tell him was like, you know, slow down, dude, you know? Um, and he said, Paul really didn't listen to him. He was very obsessed. There was nothing he could do about it. And there was nothing Bill could do about it because he wasn't supposed to, he couldn't say anything. His hands were tied. So he did what he could. Um, like I said, after all this, it does not make it right. It doesn't make it morally right. But there are there are circumstances in here that people don't know about, and um, it's still wrong. He says he regrets it. He wouldn't do the same way over again, and he felt like he was a little bit arrogant, and and he was. But um, it was it was a continuum of different circumstances that were going on, and. It's better to have a perspective of it to see what was going on and why this could have happened. Um, I don't think it's happening now. Um, I don't know if it ever happened again. If it did, nobody's admitted to it. Um, but uh, you know, it's that that that's the history of it from from his perspective and from my perspective. And oh, and I said at the end of this, I mean, did you ever get anything that was useful that you know broke it open for you? And he said no, and that's the terrible part. It seemed like it was a complete waste of time. Um, and the other part of this is that and I said this in the book, not only was he doing the stuff with Benowitz, he was also doing things like getting letters from Russia, from UFO researchers, quote unquote, that just said, you know, hi, my name is so and so. I would really like to know about your research. We have some really cool stuff here in Russia I'd like to talk to you, talk to you about. Have you heard of you know the Voronezh case or whatever? But the thing was, what he had to do was take these letters from Russia when they came from certain addresses. And call a certain number, and it was a different number every time, and read the postcard word for word, all the spelling errors, all the punctuation, everything. Then put the letter in another envelope and take it to another, po- take it to a post office, a specific post office, sometimes out in the middle of nowhere, and mail it on from there. So he was doing all kinds of, you know, um, somebody had stolen a bunch of money from the Air Force and, and, and went AWOL. So they actually had him run through bars in a certain area of L.A. looking, asking for the guy. That was another thing he did. So it wasn't just, you know, he wanted to drive Paul Benowitz nuts. And it's like, no, there was a lot of stuff going on at the same time. And he says he never took a penny for it. And I still believe him I mean, because when he was doing this, he, was, he wasn't living in the lap of luxury. He never has as far as I've – as long as I've known him. You're talking Maybe about Bill Moore. About Moore, yeah, yeah. Now, has so there, well, it's, there's... It's, this is a lot more complicated story than most people you know, uh, get in you – know, give, give it credit or get into because it's a lot easier to pass judgment and then move on. There's uh, – uh, Doty has said two conflicting statements. One, uh, and this is on the record, that he walked around with a briefcase and a duffel bag full of cash and he was doling out money everywhere. And then he then says the exact opposite, that with Bill Moore, he was giving him gas money, you know, that there wasn't any any real influence there with Bill. Uh, now, it, it, it's... It's too di- – you can't have it both ways. I'm talking about Doty, one, and two, polarized statements like that. But on the flip side, why would Bill Moore sell his soul for gas money? That doesn't make any sense. And you just said it yourself right there, that he was even doing this at some at some points for nothing. Why, yeah. why do that? At all points for nothing, by by his account to me, because he wanted to find out what was going on with the government and UFOs. And he figured, okay, if I cooperate, one hand shakes the other, and maybe they'll give me some clue as to what's going on here. I, I, you know, I've I've got an in here that nobody else has, and I'm going to exploit it. That that was his idea. And what happened was he never really found out anything that useful. Okay, and then there's uh, another part of this that uh, I. find strange and that is uh putting roswell aside and we're going to come back to that subject here in a second when it comes to Doty. um putting roswell aside everything around bill moore uh i don't i don't know what part of it is real anymore such as uh the the mj12 documents and the story behind that and the way that him and shanda ray and of course stan friedman was pulled into this too as well uh, again, probably part of the disinformation, but what part of that is is real to this day? And did Bill know that the MJ-12 documents were all a hoax? And did he just ride along with it 
uh, for fame and money and, and didn't care about the effects on the public, where today MJ-12 is still talked about in, uh, in, in 2019. Isn't there some culpability or responsibility uh, involved? Well, he believed it when it came out, as he said, as far as he could tell, it was real. I don't think he was in on it. I think the story is as what be- I've never heard anybody tell a different story. I've never heard anybody say this came from somewhere else or, you know, some different story as to how Jamie Chandra got that role of film with the original Eisenhower briefing document on it. Um, so I believe him and I believe that he believed that it was real until he looked at over a few years. He got a lot of documents. There's a book called the MJ-12 Documents that he put out with Jamie in which they basically um, said that most of the documents they got were either false or inconclusive. A few of them were said possibly real. And the, you know, the Eisenhower briefing document, which is the one we're talking about here, I think, with the list of all the MJ-12 members, he said that was probably real. As time went on, for whatever reason, at this point now, he thinks it's it was false and it was just planted to mess with him and lead people astray and see how people reacted and you know see who was interested and where these threads led. It's, it was basically chumming the water, I think, to see who was interested in what would happen. Um, but Bill did not know that at the time, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he didn't. Um, I, I don't know why people think that, you know, what, what's this thing about? Well, I don't know what to trust anything that comes out of his mouth anyway. It's like, no, he was being played. He didn't know it at the time. He had a suspicion. But he didn't know it for sure. I mean, it was like, you know, if you're a UFO researcher and somebody says, look, keep an eye on a couple of people and you get documents that nobody ever got that show that the U.S. government knows about UFOs and has known about it for a long time. Most people go, well, cool, sure, all right, until they, you know, until things get worse and worse and worse. And you finally say, uh, I don't know if I signed up for this, but you're still getting the documents. Well, um, something, so- I, something I have suggested uh, for years, I've, I've never really bent on this. But that the source of those documents was probably Doty. And the same team that was creating the fake documents at Kirkland that presented stuff to Benowitz and to Linda Moulton Howe were the same creators uh, that uh, did the MJ-12 documents that sent them to Bill Moore and, and they Jamie Chandler. They didn't have to be created in, in Albuquerque. They could have been created in Washington or at a think tank somewhere or whatever. Right. Well, that's, that's exactly my point. And they were just passed along. That's right. And the MJ-12 document that was sent to Jamie Chandra, the bright Eisenhower briefing document, that had a postmark from Albuquerque. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And but it was so, sent to him in Burbank. So uh, is Chandra still alive? I believe so. I haven't heard anything from him for years. Yeah, I've tried to chase him down, and you know, you know, we're in Burbank, and uh, I've yeah. tried to chase. Oh, him he down. doesn't live in Burbank anymore. He left a long time ago. Okay, um, like in two thousand, I think. But uh, going back to this, it seems that uh, Bill Moore and and Doty Kirkland Albuquerque uh, that was the source of of the, the all of that disinformation, all of the fake documents, everything came from that same circle. And mm, no, why not? Some of, some of it came from other other sources and other places. For instance, one time Bill was told, "Get on a plane, go to this place, meet this person at the airport." They went to a hotel, and the, whoever was there pulled out this envelope, and this was like in the east somewhere. Pulled out an envelope and said, "And this has been written up, and he's talked about it." Right. Pulled out an envelope, put it, and said, "You can." Do whatever you want with these documents, and you've got 20 minutes or whatever, and I'm just going to wait outside. Um, so he, he, I think so, in some cases he took pictures of them. In some cases he was only allowed to take notes. I don't know what. But he was given the runaround um, for a lot of these documents, and Do- Doty was sometimes – maybe even a, you know, more than more than half the time not involved. In fact, I don't know how much Doty was involved with giving documents directly to Bill at all. Um, I don't know if that ever happened. But yeah, the source of them, some of them, were from 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 AFOSI, probably AFOSI at Kirtland. It's not going to say that this is from AFOSI at Kirtland. It's just going to have a postmark. Um, but yeah, it's he got them in different ways. Some were mailed, some were showed to him, some were you know 
So it wasn't like, you know, Doty just kept handing or somebody at Kirtland kept handing him documents. That's not how it worked. Well, no, and I'm not suggesting that. I'm certainly suggesting that the, the, the parties that are in play here are always the same ones. And the and I'm talking about uh, Chandra, Bill Moore, and and of course uh, Doty, and the Office of Special Investigations with the Air Force. But the story about uh, the delivery and flying to uh, and, and going to the motel and 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 handed the envelope and he took pictures. He wasn't allowed to. Oh yeah, uh, that that came from Bill. And there's you know who the hell else is going to tell me that? So right. I got to take his word for it. Right, my, so you're right. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and my but my point, even back when I had read that story uh, and the full account of all of it, Greg, I just went, okay, you know what? This is Hollywood scripted, made up stuff. That nothing that you know what I mean. There wasn't anything at at, at a motel. This is just, uh, however, Could he be. got the documents. Uh, this is the story behind it to sensationalize it. That there wasn't this cloak and dagger uh, thing all over the United States. Uh, yeah, uh, but he didn't say the... that till years later. I don't think he, you know, until until after he'd seen the documents, digested them, and um, talked about them a little bit. I don't even know if he told these stories yet. Uh, oh, in the MJ twelve document book, yes, where they examined the documents, and said some are not, some might be good, some are. It wasn't like he put out this thing and said, "This is all great stuff, and you should you should all believe this, and this is incredible," like a Bill Cooper. Um, to me, it sounded like exactly what he said it was. I got a bunch of stuff. I didn't know if it was real or not. I checked up on it. Some of it checked out. Most of it didn't. We don't really don't know. Now, and and that's uh, that's the Bill Moore side of it. I understand that uh, you guys are friends, but yeah. But now hindsight, here we are in 2019, and we look back into the 90s and into the 80s with all of this crazy. I mean, the most insane Hollywood stuff that you could ever imagine. How much of it actually was true? How much of it do you really believe? Or was it just all made up? I've already told you what I thought. Go, I, I don't mean, think I, I think the documents for a large part were made up. But as far as I can tell, Bill hasn't lied to me. Doty, I don't know. I don't know him that well, and even some of the stuff he told me in the interview, I knew immediately wasn't true. But that's fine. You know what? I, I've got to. You've got to. You know, you play the game or you get nothing, which is the title of the first chapter in one of my books. Right, <laughs> that's exactly it. And when uh, when uh, Bill did his famous speech right in Las Vegas and and walked away from the UFO community. Um, and, uh, I don't know where Bill is today. I've heard stories. You can maybe tell us where he is today, but, um, how does Bill feel now? I mean, is there a point where maybe he should step forward and go, you know what? I need to talk about this now and, and let's put all of this clean. Where, where is he today? Where's his mind today? Not thinking about any of this at all whatsoever anymore. In fact, when I bring it up, when I do see him every once in a while, um, he doesn't want to talk about it, which is fine. He's the, sick of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do, does he uh, does he have responsibility? Is he is he okay with saying, you know, I I shouldn't have done it. I regret it. It was it was a big mistake. Or is he just sweeping it under the rug? I don't think he's happy about it, and I think he regrets it. But I also. I am. I really don't want to speak for him. I really don't. Right. Do you think he's? You no, know, I mean, because no matter what people say, I've said stuff in interviews a hundred times, and then people come back and tell me something that I've already said and contradicted a hundred times, which is why I usually don't <laughs> talk about it. And I can see why Bill doesn't like to anymore. But yes, I mean, he's, he he regrets parts of it, um, and other parts not. I mean, where people are hurt, obviously. And the guy has a conscience. Of course, he he feels bad about what happened to Paul. Um, and what you know, and to some people in the UFO community, but he, you know, he doesn't regret being able to find out what he did, and he doesn't regret being involved in something that was kind of exciting for a while. I mean, anybody involved in that would have said this is kind of exciting. Right. And the other thing people have to realize is that the Benowitz thing was one percent of a giant, 
giant counterintelligence operation because people in the UFO community look at it, it's like, oh, this big thing and it lead UFOs, uh, researchers astray. It's like, no, no, no. It was a tiny, tiny, tiny little detail. It, we think it's big because we we you know we see it in all of its in, in its history, but there is there is ninety nine percent of that story that's never been told. I don't know it. I mean, I'm not saying that, but this you know more uh, more has said this. Other people have said this. It's like the, the, it it wasn't even that important in the in the whole operation, but it was an integ- integral part of the clockwork of the operation against the Russians. That 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 is probably true. The other part of it is the impact of of the MJ-12 documents and its continuing impact on this community cannot be measured. It cannot. And to this day, uh, we we are we're discussing it right now, Greg. Right? It 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 was and and Serpo. You throw Serpo into the mix. And its impact on this community. And there are people today that still talk about Serpo as being real. And if if what uh, uh, Doty has said and and who the aviary was and who was at the top of the aviary. The aviary was not official. It was just a bunch of people interested in UFO stuff. Some of them were in the government and some of them weren't. People think aviary was some official UFO thing. It wasn't. It was a bunch of people that that wanted to find out what Bill wanted to find out, except some of them were in the government and they thought they could use that as leverage to try and find out more about the UFO subject and how much the government knew about it. And they ended up finding out nothing more than than you and I. So it was, as far as I can tell, it was, a, it was just a big letdown. Yes. The aviary was was just a way for Chandra and Moore to refer to uh, – a, a group of people so they could talk about them on the phone. Like, you know, the owl is doing this and seagull is doing this. And, you know, and so people wouldn't know what their names were. It was, you know, it's like uh, cloak and dagger spy stuff play, play, but it still was, it was serving a purpose. They wanted to be able to talk with these people and talk to them and, and communicate with each other because they were on the outside. They could th- access things that people on the government and the government couldn't and vice versa. Do you think that uh, the entire Serpo program, and I'm talking about uh, the website, uh, the disclosures, the the constant waiting for another release? And I was on that website every single day for years, man. I, you know, uh, like everybody. No, I got was. I got the emails. I got yeah, all of them. right. Exactly. That uh, that that entire thing. What was it? Uh, a government operation? Do you think it was like a CIA Project Mockingbird website, or or was it just uh, just made up? No, what it, it was just made up, but it was made up for a purpose. It was made up, I think, to pass messages. And the thing is that the you can tell this. This is you know kind of kind of how I guessed and um, had some conversations with more and other people. I kind of guessed what was going on, and they did, because the original guy, I don't think I'm getting the story wrong, um, Victor Martinez, who was right. a substitute teacher in the L.A. area, was getting all this information and pumping it back out on his website and sending out emails to a lot of people. I don't know how many hundred people were on that email list. Right. And at some at a certain point, he was getting these emails, and he was starting to correct the grammar and the, the punctuation and everything. They said, don't do that. Leave it the way it is. And he still did it, so they they got rid of him, and uh, uh, this is how I remember: got rid of him, and Bill Ryan got on it, uh, became the spokesman. But if you think about that, it's like, why would they care if somebody was changing the language or the punctuation or whatever? It's because something was encoded in those messages. There's no, there's no other to me. There's no other answer for that. Something was encoded in those messages for somebody to read. And. You know, if you extrapolate this, you think about it, it's like, well, if you can figure out what's in those messages and you start doing something about it, whether it's true or not, you know who's figured out how to do the message, uh, who figure out what the code is. And if you figure out the co- who knows who the, what the code is, what they're interested in and what they're doing about it, you can figure out who is making noise about something they're not supposed to or not supposed to know. Well, this email came from this person, and they're sending it to you know this person in Iran, and saying that the U.S. is working on so and so because they figured it out from this message. Right. And the messages are probably complete BS, or at least mostly BS, like referring to some. This this is just you know I, this is all guesswork on my part, but referring to something that is um, going on that people know about, but not that much, or intelligence people know about, but want to know more. 
So if they if they do want to know more about it, they're you know they they create some chatter and they say it's whatever whatever program. It's like okay, we know that one's fake, so we know you saw that Serpo message or somebody passed along that Serpo message to you and you knew how to decode it. I read just like you, right? I read over and over again, and and Serpo got really big. I mean, that website yeah. was just insane. The amount of information that was there. Yeah, went on uh, went on coast, and Doty well, appeared for the only other time he's ever been on coast besides when he was on with me. And I I I read it, and I I I almost got nervous. Like I thought somebody was going to kick down my front door because I was on that website. And I thought that the information was just so, so huge, right? And I was trying to figure it out, and it was so complex. And then, uh, and I've got to head towards a break. And then one day, Greg, I went, you know what? This is science fiction, right? This is, this is, this is creation, right? I don't think it has anything to do with the UFO. I don't think that there's anything direct. This is my own personal assessment. And I mm-hmm. had this weight, you know, taken off of me because I thought it was so huge and so big and 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 the real deal. And then one day I just went, you know what? No, I, I think it's science fiction. Uh, yeah, that's that's your, my... your mindset determines exactly how you deal with stuff. And if you don't, if you decide to be Zen-like and not panic about stuff, so many vistas open up. <laughs> my vistas opened up that day, man. <laughs> <laughs> they really did. Let's uh, let's take a break right here. Our guest tonight is Greg Bishop. We're going to continue. What a great conversation. All of this when we come back after this short break. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Twitter is blowing up. I'm watching you guys. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Greg Bishop. What a conversation. And uh, I'm okay. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here next, Greg. Uh, there's a couple of, I can already see that we're going to go into overtime. And, uh, and <laughs> so let's just do this. Um, I, I want to go back to something that Doty had said uh, on this program. He said, that uh, he was taken into a room with a bunch of other recruits into this Air Force uh, agent disinfo program. There was, I forget how many he said was in the room with him, but it was a room full, 40, 50 other agents. And he guessed that there was about 200 in the United States uh, that were involved in this program along with him. And that they were shown roswell film footage of the crash retrieval of uh of the ets and were given the full debriefing on roswell and that roswell was real now that's what he said on this program did he ever talk to you about roswell and if he did was it the same as what he presented here in this program and is he telling us the truth <laughs> if you ask any time, is Doty telling us the truth? You're already just lost. I, I mean, know, right? Like, I, okay. Did he discuss Roswell with you? No. Uh, he talked about working at Area 51, which he claims he did, which I don't know if that happened or not, but he says he did. Um, and said he saw stuff that Bob Lazar saw, or at least earlier versions of it. I don't know how to check that out. There's no way for me to check that out. There's no way for me to check out what he said about Roswell. There's no no. No way to cross check it unless somebody else comes up and says, I was in the room with Doty and this is what we saw and this is what we said. And he says the same thing independently. Well, then they could be in cahoots with each other. But that would be a step. So, you know, like I said, he can say whatever he wants. But if it's huh, you play the game, or you get nothing. If it's something useful that he says that's useful to you and seems to make sense and you can want to follow that thread, that's great. And if you choose to think it's all lies or whatever, that's great too. You don't sound um, su- you don't sound surprised in what I just said. Oh no, no, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, I th- I think you know I don't, you know I don't dislike the man. I think he's a fascinating character. 
Um, I'm sorry he doesn't talk to me anymore. He got he got mad when I said something about Serpo being what we just talked about um, and said he didn't want to talk to me anymore, which is, you know, it's unfortunate, but, you know, it's fine. I don't I don't feel bad. I hope I didn't insult him or anything. Um, but it's, you know, you can't you can't take anything he says really that seriously unless it's something you think is interesting and that you can follow up on. And there's certainly things that he says that are interesting that you can follow up on. So, and I can't think of any right now. I did a bunch for the book, and some of them panned out, and some of them didn't, and some of them I didn't care. So, you know, I mean, he'd tell me something, and then you know, Leonard, uh, not Leonard Stringfield, but like uh, another guy from the NSA that that he I don't think ever met would tell me the same thing, and then like. You know, Tom Dooley, would, uh, that, yeah, that was Tom Dooley from the NSA, or um, Tom Adams, the, UF, the cattle mutilation the researcher, he might tell me the same thing. It's like, okay, there's something I can hook on to here. But the point is, when I was talking to him, I listened to everything, and, and he wouldn't let me take notes or re- record it. So what I did is I drove back to my hotel really quick and wrote it all down. Um, but the, 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 the point is here that you listen to it all, and if there's something interesting in there, you follow up on it. But if you start immediately going, oh, my God, is that true or is that false? It's like you, know, you know, uh, your emotions take over and you're already filtering and you're lost. You kind of have to be zen about it and kind of like, you know, I'm not going to pass judgment. Let me just listen to everything and not care about what's coming out of his mouth. Just listen to it all because there's some useful stuff in here. I don't know where it is yet, but it's in there. What do you, and and speaking about this, uh, the you know the government influence on on the UFO subject. Certainly, we're in the middle of it right now, and what has gone on since December of uh, 2017 uh, with the New York Times and and so forth. Uh, how much of this do we trust? Uh, is the Pentagon right now suddenly our friend? I don't think so. You know, the thing is, it's um, I think when this first started happening, I put something up on my website or on my Facebook page or something for the show. And I said, beware of messages when you agree with everything somebody's saying. If somebody's just saying everything you want to hear, that's a warning sign, I think. And not a warning sign to not listen or that, you know, they're they're totally telling the truth or lying or whatever. The point is that you are all your buttons are being pushed. If all your buttons are being pushed, either the w- most wonderful thing in the world is happening, disclosure, or somebody's doing something for a specific purpose, which may not be what you think it is. I mean, the, 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 the fallout from it is what we were just talking about at the beginning, beginning of the show. More people take it seriously. Journal, journalists aren't laughing at it so much. Ac- academics and scientists are taking it more seriously. That's great. I think that's wonderful. But I don't, you know, I don't think this is like the the be all end all of disclosure. I, I don't think that at all. But you know, like I said, I'm not sitting here going, is that true? Is that not true? Is that true? Is not true? You know, I I just can't operate that way, or I, you know, I I get uh, I get burned out. I'm getting burned out just listening what what people are saying online. I had to back off of it. I I I'm kind of at the point where I don't care if it's true or not. I'm just listening. I'm at the same point. And 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 you're absolutely right. You have to. There is no other way to, uh, to deal with this, but to listen to everything. One thing you have to. And if there's a grain of something there that resonates with you and something that can help you take things further, then then great. If you don't if you don't absorb any of it, great too as well. But yeah. the but the other part of it, which I think is 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 very dangerous is that there is a reason for the timing. I don't know what that reason is, Greg, but it seems to be every, it's like at every turn, every mainstream outlet has got some UFO story today. Why is that happening? Why why now? Are they trying to get out in front of something that they can't control and they know that something is coming? And they need to acclimate uh, the world to the subject. Is it that? You know, I I'm not so sure. Why do you? Maybe. Yeah. Well, that's my question to you. Why do you think uh, the timing of this is now? You've been doing this for a very very long time, and you know it's never been like this before. You know. Yeah. And, and I know you. I don't know. There. I don't know the reason for it, really, Jimmy. I really don't. 
Um, there's a lot of ideas. Yours was one of them. That's one acclamation. Um, uh, disinformation, especially against other governments. You know, when I see some of this stuff, I'm thinking, you know, oh, these things are flying by our ships. We don't know what they are. You know, maybe somebody in China are like, we know exactly what that is. You guys have that? Oh, no. Because it's, uh, I think uh, somebody I was talking to that was uh, uh, related or, you know, um, with a, in with a TTSA, or at least think they are, or whatever, they said, if some if this is something that somebody knows how to do right now, if if those things that are flying around that were flying around the Nimitz and around the carrier groups in the east on the east coast and in the, in the uh, uh, Persian Gulf, if those, that's all true, whoever's controlling that, they don't have to answer to anybody. If some if that's an earthly uh, technology, um, either one. It's not an earthly technology, and, and it's some other intelligence doing something, which is totally possible. Or it, it is an earthly intelligence, and they're saying, we don't have to answer to anybody because we can do this. In fact, you know, if, if, if we choose to, the entire world will have no choice except to be you know, run by whoever has that technology. That, that's, that's basically game over technology if somebody has that. Um, so even the... Even the idea that that's possible can be used for for disinfo or propaganda or counterintelligence purposes. That certainly can be what's going on. It, it, that to me is scarier than if it's just ET, right? I, yeah, and, I, and I'm saying that's a possibility. And somebody's listening to this, oh, that's what he says it is. He's figured it out. It's like, no, that's a possibility, um, and it's one I haven't really haven't really heard too much, but. It's it's a it's an intriguing possibility and like and yeah and like you said it's kind of a frightening possibility, you know who has that technology and I I hope it's somebody that's friendly to us, <laughs> um, but maybe not I don't know I, I have no idea the fact is if it was if it was another country that was doing it and we didn't have the technology I don't think anybody would say anything about it in the press in the United States so I think they figured out. Either it's something else or it's something they want us – they want people to think that we have control over or you know, no control over and what the hell are we going to do about it. I, I have no idea. And I, I really don't know about the timing. Maybe it has something to do with you know, saber-rattling in China and um, India sending up rockets now to the moon and India and Pakistan getting all pissed off at each other and they both have nuclear weapons right now. Uh, you know, saber-rattling with Iran, I have no idea. But – you know, there's there's so many different scenarios for this to to be to have to interact interface with this phenomenon at this particular time, um, and I don't think anybody's got it right yet. No no guesses are right yet, but I think that a lot of guesses are right, none of them at the same time. If you know what I mean, it could be any of those things, or it could be little bits and pieces of all these things put together, which which is what I favor. I did a rundown uh, of the staff at. TTSA, and yeah. where you have nine of the 12 staff there are either CIA, ex CIA, uh, um, counterintelligence agents, uh, and some affiliation of some kind uh, with the Department of Defense. Exactly. If, yeah. If, I, I, a lot of people notice that right off the bat. They're like, whoa, wait a second. Is it? Well, did you do a, oh, wait a second? Yeah, I did right away. I just said, wow, these people, it's like a lot of the same players that were not the same players, but the same ideas and some of the same players that were, were involved, at least uh, Hal Putoff. He was he was in the aviary, I think. Pretty sure. Um, these people have been trying to figure out what this thing is for a long time. And I think some of the people in the group think that they're going to find out what, what the UFO thing is finally. And some of them are using it for you know some intelligence thing. And some of them think that there's something exploitable in there where they can they can uh, uh, they can make you know they can scale the technology or co copy the technology to something that they can that can be used I think there's all those ideas and then on top of you know on top of this all is you know what you're suggesting here is that they all have intelligence backgrounds too um, I don't know if that means it's an intelligence intelligence operation but that sh that would certainly be within the foul poles <laughs> yes it would, it would be right there. And this is this is what is crazy to me, 
if Tom DeLong steps down as CEO, because he's listed as interim CEO right now, right? Yeah, right but, at the beginning he was listed as that. Yeah, and so let's say he's, you know, he steps aside, he goes back to Blink-182 or Angels in the Airwaves, and he goes back to music, and like Semivan steps in as CEO. Are we looking at an actual CIA front company at that point? Because there isn't anybody else that is staffed except for intelligence uh, uh, personnel. It, 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 is, is that a red flag? No, yeah, well, of course it is. Um, but my attitude from the beginning has been I am neither for nor against what they're doing, but I am interested. So I'm going to pay attention. But I'm not going to make an assumption about things. I've, I've been sitting here for the last 20 minutes with you making assumptions. I have no idea. <laughs> really? And, what, see, and, but and, I'm going to I'm going to keep watching and listening and seeing what they do. And you know what you know what does that have to do in my mind? And maybe at some point, if I'm watching and listening, something I heard 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, I'm going to go, oh wait a second, and I'll either run down to you know run down there or send them a message and say uh is this what's going on or you know somebody that knows them or that won't happen and i'll just be in the dark forever i've got an idea that uh, you know if, unless there's some kind of disclosure or something like that the end game here i think that um this thing will have a it, it will it has a lifespan and it will run its course and whatever they're doing they'll either accomplish it or they won't and they will move on. I mean, that's how everything works. And at that point, we hear, won't hear anything from them anymore. And I hope it's after we figure some stuff out based on what they say or some kind of revelation or some kind of, you know, something useful that helps all of us. I would love that to happen. But I don't know. It, it might. It might. It might not. It, but, but for the meantime, it's it's the you know, it's one of it's one of the best shows in town. It is. And my take is this. This is what I've asked everybody to do. Right now, don't trust anybody. Just write on that because that's the safe zone, right? <laughs> that, that's, yeah, trust that's yourself the... and your friends. Your, the, yourself and your friends are the power elite and the, and the conspiracy, not other people. I know that that's a funny thing to say, but that's Robert Anton Wilson said that once, and I love that. No, that's that's the that's the safe bet. You know, that's the Las Vegas bet. That's the safe play. And in two years, you know, we'll give this a, like a two year run. And if what TTSA is is doing is correct, then we can establish some trust here, and then you know we can maybe uh, take a chance and roll the dice and get into the trust zone, the friend zone. But until then, yeah. let's just ride this out. It is the best show in town. I totally agree with you. No, I mean, I, I don't, I am, I, like I said, I'm neither for nor against them. Um, and I think what they're doing is exciting. And I think it's done some great, it's had some great effects. I mean, it's wonderful, some of the effects. We already talked about them. Um, but we'll see what happens, you know. I, I, the, the the fallout will take will be years. I mean, there'll still be academics and scientists interested in this weird stuff after that. They just kind of opened the door a little, said, "Hey, you know, maybe it's okay to talk about this stuff." And I think that's part of their plan. That that was definitely part of their plan. Well, I, that's that's the bonus, right? That's the bonus play. I wanted to ask you this before we head to the break. And can I get you to hang on for some overtime? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, we'll do that. Um, I wanted to ask you this: the three videos, the the gimbal and the tic tac and the go fast. Uh, you've been looking at evidence. You've been writing books. You've been doing all of this stuff for so long. Uh, what was your first uh, reaction uh, to the videos when you saw them? That they're all authentically unidentified objects that were picked up by sophisticated camera equipment. Okay, but that, you know what? We have tons of those. Yeah. Well, not tons, but we have we have quite a few. You can, you should run for politics, man. That was a good political answer. <laughs> well, that, that's how I feel. Well, um, <laughs> it, uh, um, okay. That's that was my take. Okay, that was my original take. Now, when I look at them, I don't have the same reaction that I did originally. I mean, I fought tooth and nail to people. Uh, that were saying it's nothing. And I was like, no, 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 no. These, these are the real deal. Now yeah. when I look at them, I don't have the same reaction. 
Like the Go right. Fast video, I don't even see anything moving. I think the Go Fast video is a stationary object. <laughs> That's I just I look at it now and I there's I, I don't, yeah there's I don't think been it's... really good skeptical um, uh, viewpoints of this, especially by what's uh, Metabunk. Yes, and those people are great. I like those people because I've been on their forums and they don't make fun of people. They don't say this idiot or anything like that. They just say, let's look at the evidence and see how it holds up. Now, I may not agree with them all the time, but they're they're a good skeptical organization. And they've made some great arguments against them being authentic. And you said, what was my first reaction? That was my first reaction. Now, one, I'm not sure. And two, I don't really think it makes any difference because there's so much other film and video of this stuff. And there's so many you know, eyewitness testimony and all that. If it was made up, it's just supporting stuff that's basically out there anyway. Right, right. Yeah, I don't have to say it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't affect me like it did before. Part of it is Metabunk uh centering me, right? Mm-hmm. Pulling me back in uh into the sensible zone. That's that's yes, it. They're good at that. Um I, I've interacted with some of them and they're all really I mean, they didn't know who I was and they've accepted me and said I said, Look, I'm a pilot and I've got this you know, idea about it and they said, Oh wow, really? Okay and you know, uh, something they hadn't thought of, whatever. It was with the Chile, one of the, the Chilean video with the uh, the thing in the sky that looked like a contrail that turned off and back on again. Um, that that I, I followed that very closely because they were going through a lot of things as a, a private pilot that I learned about flying and direction and, and radar and all that other stuff. And they were right. All I mean, I went through it with a fine tooth comb so the entire I. day. And I could find no fault with their reasoning. And I thought, hey, they figured it out. This is great. I mean, the last thing was, well, how does the contrail disappear? Well, that's very easy. I should have known this. Um, I'm paragliding, and suddenly I'm in, like, completely different t- feeling air. Well, that means the air has changed temperature. And if the air cha- changes temperature in the middle of the, the sky somewhere, it means that the, the conditions for uh, vapor to form out of a contrail have changed. So it'll stop. When it's in that piece of air, so it's perfectly easy for a contrail to turn off and on very, very suddenly. So you know, it, it took a while, but it was uh, really interesting to follow their logic. It just takes a little bit of work. There was one other. I want to ask you this really quick before we get to the break. And when we come back, I want to get to uh, ET writing and and your your research into that. I think it's fascinating. Uh, but before we get there, um, one thing I was taken aback about was the artistic license that uh, A&E Networks um, uh, and History Channel did with the gimbal uh, image where they changed it and altered it to make it look like a UFO with a dome on the top. And I thought that was pretty belligerent, right? Did... Did, does stuff like that bother you, or is it okay for for that type of artistic license to sell a program? It bothers me, but there's nothing you can do about it because it's TV. I don't know how much I, I really don't know how much control TTSA has over the production company. I you know they might have a lot, they might not have any. I really don't know, so it may not have been their decision. I, I really don't know. Um, I was in that show one, and they, they had me in to talk about being – it's like, these people are all intelligent, so you better watch out. Um, and all they said was afterwards, like, yeah, we know we're intelligent, but we're not doing that. We're not pulling a Benoit, so we promise. And that was the end of it. They um, actually but, yeah, said that? If you're dealing with a TV show, you, I know you've dealt with them. You can't say anything that can be construed some other way because it will probably be construed that other way. Um, and that's all TV is about is making people believe things and, and being flashy and all that. And they're going to do that. And, and it sucks. And I don't like it. And I wish it wasn't done. But um, it is. And I know why they do it. Yeah, I know. I know. Just like uh, I, I wanted your take on on Project Blue Book, uh, too, as well, because I know you're familiar with all of the cases that were presented in the series. And they took artistic license to a whole nother level. Uh, uh, to the point where it was almost offensive, but the audience that doesn't know anything about Project Blue Book or the cases specifically that are discussed here, they take it as being factual and and true. Uh, again, is is that okay to do, or is it just entertainment? Well, I, I will answer that by in, in a short answer. Um, the people that make 
if TV made UFO documentaries or dramatic series the way that UFO people wanted them made, you'd never see them. <laughs> I know. Is that, is that, and that's not – that that's that sucks and it's terrible, but that's just the way it is. It's harsh reality is what it yeah. is. Yeah, I don't like it, but you know, if I had control over it, I might do it differently. But it's also collaborative, and there's somebody at the top that can just say, "No, you're doing it this way, or you don't get paid." Yeah, you know. So it's I, it, it's not you know disinfo or anything. It's just like I don't think the audience is going to like that. It's like, but that's not what happened. No, we need advertising dollars, and people need to keep watching, and so that's why they do those things. And it's terrible. And maybe the stuff shouldn't pre- be presented as uh, entertainment. There's got to be a way to do it in an entertaining way without twisting the truth. Um, uh, my friend Paul uh, Kimball did one uh, called the, uh, I think it was called the tw- 10 Best UFO Cases. He did a film about, um, and he was not sensationalizing it at all. V- very good documentary. But uh, most documentaries, yeah, there's, there's a lot of license taken. So because people figure they have to. I don't know why they figure that. Yeah, but I know. They're probably know. right. You know, this is this is what's really funny. And oh, I, it's called Best Evidence. That's the name of the Yeah, that's a, that's a great documentary. Um, is that when I was watching, and I watched the whole series, uh, Project Blue Book, there was a part of me, because I knew too much, right? I'm just like picking it apart. And then yeah. there was another part of me, and I was getting angry. I was like, how can they do this? How can they do that? There's another part yeah. of me that was just going, you know what? This is friggin' good TV. I'm, I'm actually digging this. And, yeah. and I watched every episode, and I had to disconnect myself. If I disconnected myself, it was good entertainment. Uh, the, right. the only thing that uh, I found uh, uh, offensive was the intro and outro to the show. You know the 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 case you are about to have come straight from Project Blue Book, this, you know, and th- that this is all factual, and that's the part that's misleading. If they took out the front and the end and just ran it as a TV show, then it's no yeah. harm, no foul, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, TV shows are just to get people interested in the subject and interested in the thing and to sell advertising dollars. And if it gets two or three, you know, sharp people in to add to the conversation, great. Somebody that wasn't interested before, eventually they go, oh, that was BS. I'm still interested, though. You know? So it's it's partly recruitment, but also, you know, it's just it's like watching a talk show or, you know, a cartoon or something. It's just there to entertain. This is why Greg Bishop is on Fade to Black right now. What a great conversation. Greg, stay right there. We're going to go do some overtime. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Greg Bishop. We're going into overtime. I wanted to, I didn't get a chance to mention this before the show, that over the weekend, Rita and I binged the Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance. It is out on Netflix. It's a 10-part series. It's like 10 movies, okay? It's 10 movies. A huge investment of your binge-watching time. But if you're a fan of the original Dark Crystal, like I think we all are, this is going to blow your mind. Greg, have you checked it out yet? Have you heard about this? I've heard about it, but I don't, I don't, God, the last thing I binge watched was um, uh, Wild Country, which is mind blowing. Yes. Um, So yeah, it's really hard to get me to watch TV because I worked in post-production for like 25 years and 95 to 99% of what I watched sucked. So it's, <laughs> it's hard to get me right. on something. Plus, I'm always like doing something. I figure like I should I'm sitting here. It's watching TV. I should be producing. I should be producing something like my show or writing something or whatever. I always feel like I should be doing something besides sitting there. So it's hard to get me watching, but I'll, I'll check that one out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the original Dark Crystal, right? How great it was. And Labyrinth, too, as well. All that uh, early Jim Henson stuff was so good. But oh yeah, it's amazing. Th- this series, all I of the it. original designers, uh, the, the the painstakingly uh, produced. But uh, I'm I'm of because I do so much radio and so much television, and I'm always in production that I need to disconnect. 
right? I yeah. need to stop working, and that's and this is well worth it, man. I'm, I'm yeah. telling you, you right you now. You built your train, and it is dragging you along. Oh, you got to jump off every once in a while. <laughs> it is, it is <laughs> crazy, but it's so much fun. Uh, I want to get into uh, the alien writing aspect of uh, your research, and the reason uh, uh, I want to discuss this. First off, we don't spend uh, too much time talking about this, other than uh, people's experiences with it. But the research side of it, uh, we don't get a chance to uh, dive into. So I want to do that now. And there's another part of this that I find fascinating. Uh, and that is whether you want to call it channeling or telepathy or downloads or what, however you want to uh, approach this, that there is a lot of similarities uh, from all around the globe, cross cultures, where somebody's getting information from somewhere. I don't know if it's some crazy entanglement, particle entanglement. I don't know how uh, this communication happens, but it certainly does. And there's a lot of similarity to it. So I don't know if we want to call it a phenomenon, but it is, it's, it's occurring, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it, it, the genesis of my interest, and I'm not, you know, I haven't written books on it. I haven't gone out and active, like grabbed people and collected this kind of stuff. Um, uh, but I'm interested in it. And I wrote, um, a, basically a biography which appeared in one of the daily grail uh dark dark uh dark lore i think they're called um collections a few years ago uh it was a biography of this guy that i interviewed years ago i don't know if you heard of his name was mario pozzaglini mm -hmm. you have heard of him yes yes he was a clinical psychologist he died in 1999 uh he was a clinical psychologist um and he wrote a book called um, um, oh, what was it called? Messages. Oh wow, I can't remember the name of the book. Yeah. Symbolic messages. Right, 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 right. Self-published book. Bob Gerard from Arcturus used to sell it. Arcturus books. Um, but I saw an interview with him in uh, one of the. Um, anomalist collections that used to come out in the 90s. I think they may still be coming out from Patrick Weege. And he interviewed Mario. I read this thing and I said, wow, this guy, like, he actively looks for people that have had either been on UFOs or said they have, had an abduction, channeled, otherwise received what they say is written language from some other thing that's not human, be it aliens or angels or elves or whatever you want to call it. And he put them together in this book. I read the I, I read the interview and I thought, God, that's fascinating. I wonder how I can get in touch with this guy. This is in the '90s and I barely had internet. Right. Um, within a week, a package appeared in the PO box for Excluded Middle, my magazine, and it was from Mario. And he sent me a letter with his book for free, and said. Um, I like your magazine. Here's something I think you you I think you know I I think I knew you needed to see it. That was what he said, and he was right. I mean, um, the guy was in practice as a clinical psychologist. He had trained to be a physicist and then changed to psychology, and he was a really sharp guy, like scary scary smart guy. Um, he had helped run the bad trip tent at uh, at uh, Woodstock. <laughs> right, right, right. So he right. he he'd been around for a while. I remember so, all of this. I remember all of this. Continue. Yeah, and at some point in his life, he decided, you know what, I'm going to start studying this. And the reason, you know, I I thought it was because he just decided to start studying. So one of the examples in the book was like these little. These things that look like tinker toys or sticks with circles, but they just look like a bunch of sticks with circles on little circles at the ends of them. And what the caption was, angelic writing from child aged four to five years. I said, well, I, th I guess that's interesting. He told me after I'd known him for about a year and a half after I got his trust that that was his writing when he was four or five years old. So he had been channeling this weird writing and his mother asked him what it was. And he says it was the angels writing. He said the angels are talking to me and this is how they write. And I asked him, you know, well, how did you get, you know, how did it appear? He goes, I just started writing it. I, I, I didn't know where it came from, so I figured it was angels. And they were Catholic, so that was the model that he had. Uh, his, his, his mother was from Italy, um, Pazzaglini, right. Um, 
but he had had sightings of things growing up. He's one of those academics we're talking about that had had weird stuff happen. And he was trying to figure out how, you know, what it was. And his inroad into this was this writing, this, this strange, he called them received scripts. Um, and so he started, you know, talking to people, um, going out and actively seeking this. He got a bunch of stuff from Betty Andreessen. There's, a, there's advanced examples in his book from the Andreessen Affair, which most people listening probably know about. Um, he, uh, and then he decided, he, you know, he tried to figure out how does, you know, how, how does this compare to regular types of writing, earthly types of writing? Um, because there are, there's three different kinds of writing. There's, uh, there's alphabetic, like we have, there's ideographic, which I believe is, you know, like, um, like, uh, ch Chinese or Japanese, something like that. And there's pictographic, which is like, you know, hieroglyphs. Um, and he said that the, the, uh, writing basically broke down into these three main categories. There were some that weren't like that. Some of them like look like geometric shapes with patterns on them. Um, but I said, well, how do you tell if it's real or not? Quote unquote. He goes, well, the stuff that tends to be made up and somebody knows they're making up have a one to one relationship with the native speakers written language. Like a is this symbol and B is this symbol and C is a symbol. But then you get into things that make no sense whatsoever. He said, I said, well, what, give me an example. He said, well, Betty Andreas and stuff. It looks like nothing else I've ever seen. And I, I said, well, what do you make of it? He goes, I tried to, I tried to translate it once. I said, well, how do you do that? He says, well, I, I kind of put myself in a trance state and, and asked what it should, what it meant. And he said, I got an answer back. I said, well, what does it look like? And he said, well, sort of like alchemical symbols. And the, the, whatever he was talking to he said, well, try that. Um, and he tried it, and he said the only phrase he was ever able to get out of it, which I think is the coolest thing ever, was, if you want to make light solid, show it to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? He goes, I don't know, but it's really great poem. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it, these people that get these received scripts, it's it's their way of dealing with whatever it is that's being said to them and being communicated to them. And it's how they process their experience. And some of them, they never show it to anybody. And it's a secret and they don't mind. And other people maybe share it with friends. And some people publish whole books. There's one called um, The Language of Aui, A-U-I, by John Weilgart, I think his name is. That's a whole received language that has no relationship to you know a specific language at all, I believe. But um, there, there's so many examples of this. And... Um, I, you know, I asked, I actually asked Mario, I was like, well, are people making this up from somewhere in their subconscious? And he said, I don't think so in a lot of these cases. Well, why not? He said, they get information there is no way they should know about in a lot of cases. Um, like scientific information or musical notations or um, pieces of, I don't know, languages they don't know about that suddenly they can speak, things like that. He says it, a lot of these, you know, I think the true ones, one, don't have a relationship to the speaker's native language, and two, um, they may have some information or truths in there that the, the speaker has no way of knowing or is not sophisticated enough to know. So that, that to me is fascinating. I mean, I, I think it's an ongoing thing. I still, every once in a while, I will see examples of what is called alien writing and that it... Uh, uh, I, I would like to look into it more and talk to people, but um, Have I haven't been specifically able to... talked to anybody that has received alien or a few people informally. I've talked to them about it. And what they've told me is just what I told you. It's like, look, it comes to me. I don't know where it comes from. Or some people say it comes from these people in this galaxy and this, you know, and they're very specific. Have you been able to cross reference some of uh, the symbols, uh, specific symbols uh, from uh, not only petroglyphs or even Egyptian or other ancient texts, uh, but uh, through different experiencers that have done this and gone back and cross-referenced where there is no way that the exact symbol could have been repeated, not only over time, but over distances, too, as well. Were you able to hit the, uh, the holy, the, you know, the the holy grail of cross-referencing something that shouldn't be? Not really. 
I'm sorry to say it all. The things that looked real to Mario and that I've seen are things that don't seem to have any reference to anything else, except just by, you know, maybe chance where, you know, there's a couple symbols that sort of look like hieratic Egyptian or something like that. Right. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean anything. It just means, you know, it's a pattern that either they happened upon just by accident or that's the way the human mind works. Um, and that's, you know, and it sees things in certain, you know, there, there's a whole theory about art and, 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 uh, and symbology and all that has to do with um, hu human perception and how it perceives things and how, it, you know, artists deal with this all the time. Um, there's a, uh, I know people that are obsessed with what symbols are and how, how your subconscious and how your, even down here, you know, your culture and your DNA uh, comes up with that kind of symbol. Um, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific than that. Uh, there's also a phenomenon called asemic writing, which is a type, which is a type of artwork, which are things that look like writing but they aren't, um, which are also fascinating. I mean, they're just beautiful and they're almost like you know they're abstract art, and they can give you a certain sense or a feeling or whatever. And that, that just because of my that alien writing back, I'm really interested in that asemic a s e m i c. There's a group for it on Facebook, and you'd find a bunch of it online. What about uh, Peniston's uh, symbols that? Uh, he recounted that he saw, uh, you know, at Rendlesham. I've never really looked real. I've seen the symbols, but I've never really looked closely. I would be fascinated to know if somebody has ever found out if there, does he claim that there's a one to one relationship with English or does he even know what they mean? No, I don't. a lot of the people I've talked to and Mario talked to tell me, look, I know what they mean and they make sense to me and they, and they, um, they help me understand what's being communicated to me. But, they're not useful to other people. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. They're very, they're very personal. Yeah, a lot of almost them are very emotion. Personal. Like it's uh, it's it's an emotion or it's a color, or something like that. It's like when I see this, I understand what whatever it is, the alien or the elf or the angel or the whatever it is, is trying to say to me. Um, but it's just me. If I show it to you, it makes no sense to you unless you know that that alien elf or an angel or ex, you know, uh, extra human being thing. Well, what I, what, this is what, uh, I, this is to my untrained eye, but when I was looking at uh, some of the stuff from uh, uh, Pat Soglini back then, because a few things happened at the same time. One, there were some pretty interesting crop circles that were popping up over in England uh, mm -hmm. I was looking at uh, his text. Uh, Jackson Guitars came out with a, a guitar at the time that had these uh, symbols on the neck of the guitar. It was called the Roswell guitar. Um, and, <laughs> and, and and I was seeing um, uh, North American petroglyphs. I was seeing the same stuff on this Roswell guitar. I was seeing the same stuff coming up in England. And it all was kind of gelling uh, at the same time. And all I could say to myself was, there's a similarity here. People are getting downloads of that I'm not so sure if they're researching petroglyphs in, in the American West uh, and, and recreating those in, in fields in yeah. England. And then turning around. Complicated ones or like simple ones like spirals? And you, know, now, I, you know what? I always looked at it like... Um, uh, I think you even just said this tinker toys, right? Mm. Where I was, you know, you see the concentric circles uh, with uh, the sticks coming out of it, and and then joined together. You know, you remember how you could join tinker toys with a short stick in yeah. between the two, and yeah. and then and you know it it was like that. But mm -hmm. we, you have to look at the ages of the petroglyphs in the American Southwest. What were they seeing? How is the connection happening in in England with these crop circles? And then popping up on the Roswell guitar neck. I, I just thought that is, this is all. Maybe it was a synchronicity for you. Well, could be. But I was certainly seeing. You're, you're the connecting link there. <laughs> ah, man, I would like to, yeah, that, that would be fascinating. But the, um, uh, the, the, the symbolism of its, uh, 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 simplicity, I think is the right word, right. Yeah. That, that I'm looking for here, but 
the synchronicity of all of this happening at the same time I found very, very strange. Where yeah, is maybe this? Maybe it was something that was supposed to be very significant to you personally. I think what you should do uh, after the show tonight, look up the Roswell guitar from Jackson. Look yeah. at look at look at what's on the neck. Go look at uh, Pasaglini's uh, uh, symbols that are there. Angelic writing, yeah. Right? And and go and check that out and and see if it doesn't resonate, That if I'm not too okay. far off the mark here. Yeah, I'd like to. There's something called entoptic phenomena, too, is, is like patterns you see when your eyes are closed or when you press on your eyeballs or whatever. Those show up also in um, petroglyphs. Another thing that was pointed out, and Mario told me this and other people sort of confirmed it, is a lot of places where petroglyphs show up have radioactivity, radioactive um, elements of the rocks. You know, not enough that's going to hurt anybody or anything like that, but um, they seem to think, some people seem to think there's a connection with that, too. Is Mario still alive? No, he died of um, pancreatic cancer in 1999. 1999. Yeah, I just got that. Yeah, I'd only known him for like four or five years. We saw each other at Roswell in 97, and we hung out. So it was the only time I actually got to hang out and talk with him. And we we went thrift store shopping because we were bored with the with the uh, lectures. I said, "Mario, you want to go to any lectures?" He said, "No." And he <laughs> said, "Do you want to go thrift store shopping?" I said, "Yeah." So we went, and we do you know what a violet ray machine is? No. It is a quack medical device from the nineteen the teens, twenties, something like that. That was basically a uh, a, a glass tube that had, you could apply had a little wand you could attach it to, and it would apply power uh, electricity to it. And it would, there was, I think, I can't remember what kind of gas in it, but it was it would glow purple, violet. And you're supposed to run it over your arms and stuff. Anyway, we're walking through a thrift store in Roswell, and he, he points at the floor and says, "Oh, a violet ray machine." And it's a, it's a, it's an old wooden box with leather wrapped down, around it. It's like, how do you know what that is, Mario? Because I collect them. It's like, well, luckily because he already had one, so I bought it. I still have it. Does it work? <laughs> Does it work? Yeah, it works. It makes a very funny noise. And when you run it over your skin, it gives you tiny little electric shocks, and it glows purple. You're your supposed arm? to, like, you know, stimulate hair growth and get your blood flowing and all that. Your arm is going to fall off. <laughs> yeah, I better not use it too much. Well, with all of your research, um, and I want to thank you for an absolutely uh, uh, mind-expanding conversation tonight. I expected it, but I want to thank you for that. But if you were sure, a, if, if you're a betting man, Greg, and you had the one case that uh, that you were sure about, right? You're in court, and you're going to present the evidence of the one case. The one UFO situation. What case is that? I I really don't know. I have favorites. Probably my favorite has been for years, and you can see it on my um my avatar is Pascagoula. Yeah, that's a, that's a strong one. I always thought it was a strong one, no matter how many. And the the fact that um uh. Cal, I mean, uh, Calvin Parker's still alive. Have you had him on? No, we uh, almost had him on last year. We went back and forth, and we just couldn't work out uh, okay. a day. But uh, I'll, I'll do Hickson it soon. Hickson wrote a book, uh, co-wrote it with, a, uh, I think, a guy named Mendez, I believe. Anyway, he wrote a book about his experiences, and he was a repeater. He had other stuff happen to him, which you know used to be anathema. It's like, oh, well, he's making it up. But I think it strengthens his case. And one of the cases was they saw like a giant glowing saucer shaped thing with lights hanging over a highway in rural, um, I think it is Louisiana. His whole family, like six people in the car. And uh, that that to me is fascinating, which makes the case even more rich for me. And then I guess recently they've had people to come forward and said they saw other stuff either in the same area at the same time or whatever as uh, as Hickson and Parker did at Pascagoula. Yeah, I, 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 I'm with you on that. When uh, that case broke, I was I was very young, but it made the headlines and yeah. it was uh, it was front page news. Everybody was talking about it all around the country. Mm-hmm. And at that age where I was so into the UFO subject, uh, it is something that has stuck with me uh, over the years, and yeah. and Calvin, um, I I I hold him up there uh, right next to Travis Walton, and I think you know that both of those cases are very, 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 very strong. 
Um, Calvin's case is is about as fascinating as as it gets. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. Yeah, and, and maybe Socorro too. You know what? And that's a, you're right. You and I think uh, right along the same path. Um, uh, I think Socorro uh, Zamora. Uh, I think is one of the more. Uh, how do I want to say this? Um, because of his law enforcement background and who he, his um, recollection and the facts of the case and how he is able to uh, to present it from that mindset is yeah. something that we need to honestly uh, seriously take a look at. And yeah. there was also well, multiple witnesses in that case mo- too. Multiple. A family saw it floating over the highway. Yep, and uh, you're talking about at the gas station. Yeah. Yeah, the gas station part of it. And then you have the J. Allen Hynek aspect uh, to the case, too, as well. Yeah. Fast. Yeah, and Ray Stanford, who went out there and wrote a whole book about it, he was there before the Air Force. No, he was right after the Air Force, but before um, – or right out – I can't remember. Some government entity got out there before him, but he got out there before Hynek, actually, by like a day. There's a couple uh, of photographs, and I think Ray took one, um, and you can see in the background – what what <laughs> looks like, uh, and it's way off in the distance, but it looks like an egg shaped craft with legs coming off of it. And yeah, I've seen that image. Yeah, I don't know what to make of it. It's kind of fascinating, and that's like. And it, I said, did it? Sh-, and I was thinking, did it show up in other pictures? But I think that's a. No, I think he has multiple pictures, and that's the only one that that kind of stuff shows up in. Which it was an accident. Shit on the film. Yeah. Sorry, dirt on the film. Yes. or whatever. But. It's it's kind of fascinating. I don't know what to make of it. You know, you start thinking like things like Ted Serios and and doing that stuff. We're putting you know images on film just by thinking about it. So who knows? So what's next for you? Are you heading uh, to Phoenix? Yeah, I'm going to go to uh, actually go to um, uh, UFO Congress. Yeah, because I've got friends speaking there, and uh, and it's it's just always good to get together with people and talk. And my my some. I've got friends from all over the belief spectrum, and I like it that way. Some of my friends don't even like each other, and that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you uh, – aren't you uh, uh, presenting there this year? No, no, no. Uh, I don't have – the last thing I spoke at was um, um, Utah UFO Fest, and then there was a small meeting out in uh, Joshua Tree that I, 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 I spoke at. But there's uh, right, nothing on the horizon right now. Um, not yet. I mean, I've got some, I've got people that have called me, but it, it's nothing is settled yet. So no, I'm not speaking this time. I've spoken, I spoke at two UFO Congresses when Bob Brown was running them and one since Alejandro, uh, Rojas has taken over. Thank you so much, Greg. And your research is phenomenal. And how often, uh, do you release a new podcast? When I feel like it, there's one coming up in the next week or so. Um, and I will continue uh, I, I will continue. I've, I've, I went on a hiatus for about three months, but now I'm, I'm back. And so I've got some backlogs, uh, with, uh, uh, various people talking about all kinds. I talk about whatever I want to on my show. And I don't really care if somebody's popular or not. I talk to them about what I want to talk about with that person. Like you do. Right on. Thank you so much, Greg. What a great night on Fade to Black. I want to thank you for that. And uh, be safe out there. And it's Radio Mysterioso dot com. Yeah. And the links are over at Jimmy Church Radio. You can just click and head straight over. Uh, it's a great site. Thank you so much, Greg. Be safe out there. Thanks so much. Great conversation. Loved it. You're the best, Greg Bishop. Again, Greg's links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. And with that, I'm going to get out of here. Tomorrow night, Emery Smith is uh, back with us. So we'll see everybody tomorrow night. Thursday night's another Fader night. Open lines all night long. Fade to Black's executive producers, Rita Camarion. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And syndication is by KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast only copyrighted 2019 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Emery Smith, I want everybody to be safe. Go Beckley Tappy.